Thank you very much for having me uh, and welcome to ESET Security Days. What I'm going to talk, talk about today in my presentation is going to be the effects that the Russian war on Ukraine has on the threat landscape. But before we get to that, I'm also going to show you what we found in Ukraine in the last couple of months and last couple of years for context. I'm not going to introduce myself. I'm going to skip that. So let's start with the date 24 February of 2022. I guess everybody in this audience is aware of what happened on that day. Russia invaded Ukraine. But what we have seen in the cyberspace started unraveling already a few hours before. So on the February 23rd. And that was uh, an attack on a few high profile organizations in Ukraine. Very destructive attack, trying to wipe the data in their systems. And the attack, we named the malware that we have seen, Hermetic Wiper. Again, before we get to that, you need to get a little bit of context. And the context starts in 2014, when Russia occupied Crimea and annexed it. At that time, also, we have seen an increase in cyber attacks. And it has been going on since 2013, but at that point, there were not that many APT groups that were known that were doing this. And there were some spear phishing campaigns, some uh, quite quite high quality social engineering campaign scene. And there was this one specific modular malware that we have been tracking, and that was Black Energy. To get to it, the Black Energy, that was the product of one of many groups that are attacking Ukraine. And uh, the most prominent one is probably Sandworm, which was connected to one specific organization, security organization in Russia, namely the GRU, which is the Russian Military Intelligence Service. This attribution has been done. You cannot see that because it's all the way in the, down on the line. But Microsoft, FBI, UK uh, Secret Service, uh, Ukrainian Secret Service. So there are many sources that confirm that these guys are from the Russian military service. And on top of that, in October 2020, FBI even publicly indicted six people. So we know the faces of people who are working for the GRU, who are running the Sandworm group and attacking Ukraine, but also other targets around the world. And as I said, Black Energy was their probably first product that made its way into the headlines. In 2013, it was mostly spear phishing. They were using zero days in PowerPoint, for example. Even if you had the latest updates from Microsoft, you would get hacked through this zero day that they found. And the modular malware, Black Energy, has been shown that, uh, has shown that it has quite the capabilities. Because in December 2015, Black Energy caused the first blackout in history caused only by malware. What we have seen was a organized manual, actually, or partially manual attack against four different Obel Energo companies in Ukraine. So these are the power distribution companies that are in charge of distribution, uh, distributing electricity around their um, regions. And what it caused, the attack, the attackers used remote access to these companies. They gained through these spear phishing campaigns and they did a lot of reconnaissance, so they were aware how the system works, what to do if you want to turn off the electricity, and at one point, which was on December 23rd, around Christmas, probably that was also the goal, to show this during the holidays, and at that time, they were able to attack the systems, turn off electricity for 230,000 people for about six hours. That was the first blackout ever in history that was caused by malware and hacking attack uh, in combination. That was December 2015. Now, in December 2016, a year later, the attackers came back. This time, they, they had a smaller scope, so they were attacking only one electrical substation, although a pretty important one because it's in Kiev North, but it, only, it had like bigger emissions. 
So smaller target or smaller area of targeting, but bigger ambitions. And I will explain what I mean by that, because it's Industry, this was the second malware they used, had uh, much different characteristics than Black Energy. Industry didn't do this in manual way. So there were no operators that had to remotely uh, log in and do anything on the systems. They could just run the malware at a specific time and it knew what to do because it spoke the language of the systems, of the ICS systems. And this was the probably most striking feature because Industry was able to de-energize power lines by speaking to the industrial systems in their own language. It spoke four different industrial protocols and that was what changed um, actually our view of how this type of malware can work because it showed that the attackers were deeply in the system, they understood the protocols, they knew how they worked, they knew there was no security, authentication or whatever, so they misused that and they were able to use malware to automatically de-energize the power lines. But that was only the first step. The second step, after everything went dark, they wanted to deny the operator's visibility. So they used the wiper to remove the SCADA software that was controlling those systems, this, these ICS systems that were distributing electricity, typically circuit breakers. Again, this was not the final goal. They wanted to disable, as soon as the operators didn't know what was going on in their environment, they wanted to disable the protection relays. If you don't know what, I, what protection relay is, don't worry. This is the picture of it, this type of box. Uh, it's important because if you are running power lines, you have different fluctuations in current uh, and voltage. Things can change in the power grid quite dramatically. And if you don't have anything that will like, fix those issues, then the whole power grid can get damaged and stop working, basically. So this was the goal. They wanted to disable the protection relays so there will be no protection from any changes in current and make the whole, whole power grid uh, instable. So they knew the operators from the 2000, they knew how the operators worked from 2015, from the black energy attack. They knew that they will go in the full manual mode, they will try to reestablish control and everything, but in between the, the, the protection relays will be, closed, uh, will be disabled, and now when they re-energize the lines and they have no control, no visibility, there will be these uh, sudden changes and the uh, equipment will get damaged. If the equipment in power grid gets damaged in this way, it can take hours, days, and then maybe even weeks or months to repair because you need to buy all the new components, you need to replace the uh, substations and everything. So it's really a bad type of attack. So this was the end goal. Luckily, Ukrainians were quite ready because after the 2015 attacks, they already seen what the attackers can do and they were ready to defend themselves. So that was one thing. And the, the second one, is it, it was a bit of luck that Sandworm made some mistakes in the code. So it didn't run quite as, ex as expected. The blackout took only one hour, which even for the users, like end users in Kiev, wasn't that dramatic. And there was no physical damage in the end. Moving on to other operations that Sandworm has under its belt. Because Sandworm is not the only, that's the umbrella term, but they have different sub-teams that are working in different ways. So for example, they have gray energy, they are doing more reconnaissance and espionage, and they are quiet. And then there is this loud unit that's called Telebots. And probably the loudest signal that they have sent was in June 2017. I don't know, probably you heard of it, it's NotPetya. Uh, NotPetya was quite a big problem because it took down a lot of systems looking like ransomware. Uh, it was encrypting the stuff, it was asking for ransom, but it was only a false facade. They were not really trying to help the victim, there was no way to decrypt it. Even if you got the key, you could not enter it because it would not accept all the characters. So they knew what they were doing. And it was damage. The only goal was to damage Ukrainian systems. And they, they were quite successful. Around 80% of businesses in Ukraine went down due to this attack or had some damage on their systems. How could that happen? 
And that is what we see as our biggest contribution in this case as ESA research, because we found that it was the telebots, so we could attribute it to sandworm, and the second thing, we found the patient zero. We knew where they started. It was a small accounting company called Emidoc. Their update system was hacked, and from there, they used it as a springboard to spread the malware to all the companies around Ukraine. Why is it important? Emidoc is a really small company, actually. It's a few dozen people who are working on an accounting, but it's really popular. So hugely popular that 80% of the companies in Ukraine were using it and had that in their systems as a legitimate tool, so it was even hard to stop the infection because that was a legitimate update that was running from their servers. Everything was fine, kosher, everything should have been okay, but it was the bad guys who were sending the update. And of course, it started in Ukraine, but it spilled over. Because many of the systems in Ukraine were connected to the global networks of bigger, uh, com uh, bigger companies, either was it partners of the smaller companies in Ukraine or the branches that were sitting in Ukraine. And actually, there was, this was the most damaging attack that we have seen in history. Uh, all the, the damage in, uh, together was around 10 billion, and that's only what we know of. Big brands impacted, including Grosneft, which is Quite interesting to see because it, probably this was collateral damage and it should not have happened in the beginning. And now we're getting to the fact that Sandworm is not only attacking Ukraine. So if anybody asks us if Sandworm and APT groups from Russia are targeting other countries, yes, they are. It's just not Ukraine. Ukraine is the springboard often, but other companies, NATO, uh, other countries, NATO countries, EU countries have been targeted by Sandworm, by Gamma Redon, by many other players that are in the security apparatus of Russia. So we need to be prepared for those attacks and think about them in the future. So that gets us to Hermetic Wiper. That was 23rd February of 2022, approximately. 12 hours before the attack, before the invasion started. High-profile organizations, more than five of them in Ukraine, had hundreds of systems wiped. Wiped means all the data has been overwritten with zeros, nothing works, you cannot get to your data, there's no way to recover. And the Hermetic Wiper was quite complex. It was going after master boot record, uh, master file table, even some registry keys and it disabled the volume shadow copies. So there was almost no way to recover from this. It was even hard to find out what was going on because even the logs were hit. What's interesting, the compilation stamp of the Hermity Wiper was from December 28, 2021. So this attack has been in making at least for two months, and that's the compilation stamp. So that's the day when they compiled the file, but they had to program it and put it all together. So probably even more than two months. And that wasn't the last wiper that we have seen since the, uh, since the invasion. So the second one was on 14th of March, so a few days after the invasion. It was Caddy Wiper. And it was a little different. It was less sophisticated than Hermetic Wiper, but it did its job. Uh, and it was targeting financial sector, and it was hitting dozens of systems. Again, we analyzed it. We gave our inf information also to CERC QA, so they know how to act if they see this again. And they saw it again. They saw it again on 8th of April, when Industrial 2 hit. It, the whole story unraveled in a very interesting fashion. Third UA was contacted by one of the Obel Energos that they have some kind of incident, and they need more information to know how to act on it. So Third contacted us with the malware sample, asked us to help them with the analysis, and after we confirmed what we found, that it's a new version of Industroyer, so one of the most dangerous malware attacks that we have seen in our history, we were able to give them that information and they were able to defend themselves. It got the attention of news because it was probably the biggest type of cyber attack that we has, have seen since the, uh, since the invasion started. Had it been successful, around 2 million people would be without electricity. If it were successful, again, physical damage, hard to replace parts, and it would be complicated to recover. So it was most certainly the, the most significant cyber attack that we have seen in the last few months. Now, we had a presentation at Black Hat, and Viktor Jora, 
who is the head of cybersecurity unit in Ukraine, joined our researchers and he told us a little bit more. So we didn't know before, but he told us that the initial compromise started on February 11th, or maybe even earlier, but that's the like time, time that they found where, where the attackers were already in the systems of the Oblo Energo. Another inf interesting part of the information that we, he shared was that they saw two different types of malware, load maze and metal predator, and as you can see, it was targeting different operating systems. Interesting thing, load maze was waiting for a command line argument that included the letter Z. Z, can, you can see the letter on the tanks, you can see that everywhere during this invasion. It's the symbol for Russia for this invasion. There's also other letters, but Z is the probably most vivid one. Looking at Industry R2, it was simpler than the first version that we have seen in 2016. It only spoke one protocol, but it was the one that the Oblo Energo was using. So it probably they were inside, they knew what was going on, and they knew what they needed to use. There was also code similarity, more obfuscation stuff was not really in plain text, so it was harder to analyze, but still there was uh, similarities. And it was accompanied by a multitude of wipers. Again, they were going after Solaris systems, Linux systems, Windows systems. They were trying to disable as much as possible and make as much damage as possible. And one of those wipers, you probably guessed it, was Kelly Wiper. So we already seen that on April 8th, uh, sorry, uh, March 14th. Now in, on April 8th, Industry was accompanied by the same wiper that we have already seen. Thanks to that, we were able, again, to attribute all of this to Sandworm. Now, that was all information about Sandworm, but there is a lot of other groups that are doing stuff in Ukraine and around the world. Gamma Redon is probably the most vivid one because they are doing it loudly. They don't care about detection. They just want to make as much damage as possible. Sednit, for example, we found their uh, malware that was targeting UFI. So they were attacking systems under the level of operating system. So they are advanced. They know what they are doing, technically skilled. They know how to program new malware, how to attack different systems that are used throughout the Western world and basically anywhere else. One example that includes also the Baltics, uh, CERT UA has informed about this a few, a few weeks ago. Gamma Redom was targeting Latvian uh, government governmental bodies, governmental organizations, and what they were using was the Ukrainian war as a lure. So they were using RAR archives, assistance, and necessary military assistance. If you unpacked it, it contained files that were named list of necessary things for provision of military humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. Long name, but still trying to use Ukraine as the topic to, to lure the victim in to click on something. And in the end, it would lead to compromise in a way that the attackers gain access. And again, they can uh, install and run some malware, do reconnaissance, espionage. So the end goal is not really that clear here, but still they were able to do this via these types of emails. Funny thing, we took those files that CERT UA found, we ran it through our telemetry, and we found that they were targeting Bulgaria a few weeks later with the same thing. So they don't care, they are really loud. With Gamma Redon, that's very interesting because there were some reports they are operating from Crimea. So again, an interesting point in this whole setup. So I think that's interesting to see that they are also targeting the Baltics and this region. Now, Russian war on Ukraine has sent ripples through the threatscape. So we have seen a lot of changes in, uh, in the threats and the way they behave and the way they target things because of this change. We wrote about it already in our threat report in T1, in, that's January till uh, April, and we are currently working on the second issue that's going all the way to August. It seems to be confirmed, all of the findings that we have written there are uh, confirmed right now with the new set of data. It's a 50 pages long document, so if you're interested in type of threats that we have seen, the, our data, we are trying to be as methodological and as objective as possible about it and publish everything that we have. I suggest you download it. This is the T1, but on WeLive Security, there will be a new issue in a few weeks. So what has changed? 
exploits. That's one of the categories that was hit the most. And what I mean by exploits are different types of intrusions into your systems through network, through exploit exploitation of vulnerabilities, uh, looking for mis um, con misconfigured systems, for example, RDP with weak passwords. That's something that they were looking for. And since the beginning of the pandemic, this was a very important system because if you don't know it, you can use it for remote access. It's built into your Windows system. You only need username and uh, password. If it's easily guessed, the attackers get legitimate access into your network and can elevate their admin rights and whatever, just do reconnaissance. In 2021, we have seen the, the number of these types of attacks, the password guessing against uh, public facing uh, RDP systems to explode. At the end of the year, it was two, uh, 300 billion attacks that we have detected. So 300 billion password guesses were thrown at systems that were public facing. What's interesting about that, any time they were successful, if they were to be successful with those guesses, they would get inside, could install ransomware, Cobalt Strike, any type of malware they want, or be quiet about it and just do reconnaissance and look into your systems. It changed when maybe a few weeks before the war. Let's question what was the connection there. But on January 10th, we have seen the numbers nosedive. And nosedive like really going down by it says 40%, but you can see how it went down. It was going down in the number of Unix systems uh, saying that they have seen such attacks. That's the dark red line. And the lighter one is showing the number of attacks. And in T2, the numbers went even lower. So we, they have lost 91% of their activity in the last four months. T2 is April, uh, May till August, those months. So you can see that RDP is really going down, and it's the same thing in, in Baltics. So Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia have seen also less systems being attacked by this type of, this type of password guessing, and also the number of the guesses is going down by 81%. Possible reasons, okay, to be objective about it, pandemic is receding, more people are working from uh, the offices, so less remote work, maybe that was one reason. Yeah, people learned about it and now know how to secure their RDP systems. So that's why there is less interest by the cyber criminals and probably war in Ukraine. That's my guess, my personal guess, because I, as you can see, the change was really dramatic. So probably somebody had to prepare for something else and didn't have time to do these types of attacks. But that's just a guess. And in the last few weeks, there was also a new feature that was announced by Microsoft, and there will be a brute force protection in Windows 11 for the remote desktop protocol. So again, something that might dissuade more attackers from using this type of attack vector. Looking at the geography, the most targeted systems are in the Western Europe and the Northern America. It has been confirmed also uh, during the uh, the. T2, so the last four months, we have seen this even intensify. So Western Europe, NATO states, all of them targeted quite heavily with this type of attack, even though in a lower volume. And another one, another category that has changed due to the war was ransomware. First big story connected to ransomware was Conti Leak. If you didn't hear about it, Conti is a gang that is residing inside Russia and we know they have been running this a big, as a big business. They have employees, they have IT support, they have even their own HR and hiring hackers to do the work. Some even don't know they work for them. That's funny, but really funny. Some of the parts of the code are coded by people who don't know they are working on malware. And we know this thanks to ContiLeaks because there was a Ukrainian developer that was sitting in their systems, he hacked inside, and he got so pissed by the invasion and by the way that Conti acted about it, because they supported Russia, they, he said, okay, I'm leaking everything. And he leaked everything on Twitter. So we could read years of their communication, internal communications. You even see who's, who has bad relationship with who, and like, it's really funny. You have to have a few days to read it because it's a lot of stuff. What's interesting there, they have even connections to FSB. So they are connected to the secret service in Russia. Another thing in ransomware that changed 
was that before Russia was avoided by ransomware gangs and ransomware attackers at all costs. In T1, the biggest spike, that was a Russian company. It was maybe, it was hundreds of endpoints that were targeted by this one uh, attack, this one file coder, and it's interesting to see that big companies, big enterprises in Russia became the target. That was unheard of before. Also, if you look at the data, Russia was targeted by the most ransomware attacks like in the last maybe three years. Russia was never on top of the table, but right now it is there and it's staying there. Another thing that is supporting our, or this conclusion that the, the attackers from ransomware scene are focusing on Russia more are uh, hacktivists and spe specific groups that are targeting uh, sensitive systems in Russia. So for, exa for example, Roscosmos and Russian TV have been targeted by this group, NB65, who leaked their uh, sensitive data. So again, something that is pointing to the fact that even the high-profile organizations in Russia are targets now, which was not like that before. And there are other APT groups that were targeting, for example, old Gremlin, again, using ransomware against the banking sector, financial institutions, uh, industrial enterprises, IT. I even have to read it because it's so many. And one more thing that is really interesting for me, and that's going to close this presentation, is that in the top 10 of ransomware, when you look, Windows lock screen uh, Trojan is there. Lock screen is an old type of ransomware that is going to block your screen and you cannot access your computer. It's not encrypting anything, stealing anything, doing basically anything too bad, but it's going to lock your screen and send you some message. And this is the message that most of the lock screens are sending right now. Of course, they are targeting mostly the Russian systems, although Ukrainians are also high on the list, but this is one of the most prevalent variants that we have seen. Glory to Ukraine. If stuff like this interests you and you want to know more, because in 30 minutes or 20, I don't know how much I had, uh, you cannot fit everything in. So I really suggest you read our research at uh, We Live Security, that's our blog, or you can uh, just follow our you said research Twitter, that's actually no products, no marketing, but we are trying to show only the research information. So if you're into IOCs and technical details, that's where you go. I see a few cameras, so I'll wait. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Thank <laughs> you.